Welcome to this sixth tutorial video about using Realtest. In this video, we're going to take a look at long-term systems that trade just infrequently, like once a month, and use a momentum or relative strength indicator to decide which are the strongest stocks to enter and rank them accordingly. So let's get started. So this is a variation of one of the example scripts in Realtest's directory of examples called NDX Rotate. And it's a relative momentum strategy which trades the NASDAQ 100. You'll need NOR gate data at the platinum level for this to work because we need to have all the historical constituents of that index. So let's take a look at the import section. Uh, we're importing from NOR gate, we're importing the NASDAQ 100 current and past to include those delisted stocks. And we're also needing to include the SPY, so that's the uh, S&P 500 ETF, which isn't in the index, so we need to actually specify it as an extra include list item. We've also got this exclude list, and that uh, exclude.txt file just simply has a few duplicate symbols. So for example, Google's parent company, Alphabet, actually has two types of shares, both listed in the NASDAQ 100. We don't want to trade both of those at the same time because they're effectively the same company. We're going to include the NASDAQ 100 index, the NDX constituency, and we're going to start at 2004. We could go back further, but we want to include at least one large bear market, as you'll see later, and go up to the latest date and save this as ndx.rtd. And then our test settings are pretty much a standard with an account size of $100,000. So let's take a quick look now at how rotational strategies work. And sometimes these are called relative momentum strategies. So what happens is we take the whole of our market, in this case, the NASDAQ 100, and I'm going to just list the first 10 symbols. And we have some kind of factor that we calculate, which gives an idea of how quickly this stock has been going up historically. So we might call that the momentum, or we might call it a strength factor. Either of those terms are commonly used. And as you can see, we then rank all the stocks based on the highest first of those momentum factors. So in this case, at the end of December this year, uh, Tesla, TSLA, was the highest factor for momentum, and then Piton, and then PDD, and so on. And we go all the way down, and that would continue right the way down to the bottom 100. Then at the start of the month, we take a look at this factor because there's good academic evidence that the strength or the momentum of a stock tends to continue. So in this case, we might decide we're going to trade the top five stocks each month. So that would be Tesla, Piton, PDD, I'm MRNA, and Melly. And those would be the five stocks that we would open a position in. Then at the end of that next month, we would get ready for the coming month. So the end of January, we would look at the factor again for all the stocks. And here we are, it's changed. And we see that Tesla is no longer the top momentum stock for that last period. And it's now MRNA. But Tesla is still in the top five. So we examine the top five and we see that they're very similar. And we fill our symbols in according to that ranking. As you can see, Melly is now number six. So that now drops out of our ranking for the symbols we're going to put in. And we actually exit that stock. And a new one, ZM, has come in. And that one we put an entry order for. The others have changed position, but we don't actually need to exit them at all. And we do the same at the end of February, ready for March. So here's the ranking for the end of February. And you can see again, MRNA, Tesla, PDT, all in there. But we've now got Baidu coming up to position rank four. And so that's our new one. We're going to enter Baidu and we're going to exit ZM because that's no longer in the top five. And we carry on in this manner each month reassessing it. So how do we actually calculate that factor, that momentum or relative strength factor? Well, one simple way of doing that is to simply take the close price at the end of the past month and then compare it to the close price three months ago or six months ago or nine months ago or 12 months ago. And in this case, we're going to use all of those ranked differently. So we're going to compare this price to this and look at the percentage change. So as you can see, this is a stock chart of Apple and it hasn't changed an awful lot in the last 63 days, which is one quarter, roughly three months of trading days. 
and then we also compare it to 126 days ago, in other words, six months ago, trading days, uh, 189 days, which is nine months ago, and 252 days, which is 12 months ago. And obviously the change that you've had most recently is going to be the most important. So it's quite common to rank these differently. So when we're creating our relative strength factor, we're actually going to take 40% of the first quarter figure, and then 20% of the figure that includes the first quarter and the second quarter. So that's 10% of each quarter, which makes 20% of that total amount. And then 20% uh, of the next quarter again, which is going to be about six and a bit percent uh, of each quarter. And then finally, 20% of the whole year, which is going to be about 5% of each quarter. And if we add those up, then we find that the first quarter gets a weighting of about 60 and a bit percent. The second quarter gets just over 20%. The third quarter gets just over 10%. And the last quarter gets 5%. And by combining these together, we create a strength factor that shows how much momentum each stock has exhibited. As well as ranking our stocks against each other using the relative momentum or strength factor that we've just looked at, we're also going to want to have some filters in there. And that's because this is going to be a long only system, which means that we are not going to benefit if the market is in a big downtrend. So we're going to try and avoid bear markets. And the first way we're going to do that is with a filter against the relative strength factor being below zero. So we're going to make sure relative strength factor is above zero. In other words, the stock has been trending upwards. Secondly, we're going to take a look at whether the stock is in an uptrend by another measure. And that's simply using a moving average, a 200 period moving average shown here as the blue line. And if the stock closes below that, for example, in this period I've shown in red here, then we're not going to enter at that point. And thirdly, we're going to do the same for the whole market. And that's why we included the SPY symbol, so that we can actually look at the 200 period moving average for the whole of the market, and then exclude periods where, as shown in red here, the market is closing below its moving average. If the whole market is collapsing, we don't want to be entering. In real tests, the equivalent statements for these are going to be that our factor is above zero, that the close of the stock is above the moving average of the close over the past 200 bars, and that the same is true for the market. So we're going to look at the close of the SPY and check that it's above its moving average of its close over the last 200 bars. Effectively, these add what we call an absolute momentum filter. And so we've got relative momentum when we rank the stocks according to whether they are stronger than each other. And we've got absolute momentum, making sure that we're not entering in downtrends. And together, these are sometimes referred to as a dual momentum system. Now, you may recall that in our previous video, we took a look at the way that real test can decide which stocks are going to be entered. And there's some fairly complicated different setups that we can have, but this is a very straightforward system. So we're simply going to be using market orders at the beginning of each month for N, in this case, five positions with a fixed sizing. And so we simply need to define an entry setup that decides which stocks will qualify. And that will then produce a shortlist. We're then going to use an entry score. So we're going to look at which ones are the highest. And in this case, that's our relative strength indicator. And it sorts it. And then we're simply going to take our maximum positions, in this case, five positions for each month. And so we don't need to use a lot of the complexity because we're not putting limit orders in or anything like that. And we're only trading once a month. So here's our script where we implement that. We first of all want to calculate that moving average over the past 200 bars. So that's MA200 we're defining as the moving average of the close over the past 200 bars. And then we're going to use that to define this variable uptrend, which is a true or false, true if the close is above that moving average over the last 200 bars. And it does that for each individual stock that it goes through. We're also going to want to check that specifically for the whole market. And we do that by using this reference here, external dollar SPY. So the symbol name is preceded by a dollar to say that we want to look at the symbol, not just for the actual one we're looking at right now as Realtest is doing its calculations, but for the one that's labeled SPY. And we're particularly looking for whether the SPY, the whole market index, is in an uptrend. In other words, whether its close is above the moving average of the past 200 bars as 
has been calculated previously. So this will be true if the whole market's close is above its moving average. Then we calculate the relative strength factor that we've taken a look at. So that is 0.4, in other words, 40% of the percentage change of the close over the past 63 bars, plus 0.2, so 20% of the percentage change over the last 126 bars, and the same for the 189 bars, and the same for 252 bars. And that gives us that relative strength factor that is commonly used that we described earlier. And finally, we define this true or false variable called can hold, and these are the filters that we're going to use to decide whether this stock is something that we will take a position in. So first of all, it has to be in the NASDAQ 100 at the particular bar date. So we want to check that only uh, stocks that are currently in the index are eligible. We're going to require that the close is above $10, uh, just because lower price stocks tend to be a bit erratic. And then here are our three filters. The relative strength factor is going to be above zero, so it's in an uptrend. We've also got our defined uptrend by saying that the close is above the uh, moving average of the past 200 bars, and the same for the market, bull market. So our strategy is actually very straightforward. We simply define that it's uh, going to be on the long side, that we are going to have a quantity of 100 divided by the number of positions, 5. So in other words, we're going to be taking 20% of each stock. And we are simply going to enter if these two things are true, if can hold is true, and it's the end of the month. So this end of month is a function that Realtest provides that simply is true on the last day of the month, which means that entries will be on the next bar, the start of the next month. We're going to rank everything by the factor, the relative strength factor, so the highest ones are prioritised and only take a maximum of five positions. And we're going to exit every position at the end of the month. Now, in reality, we might not want to exit every single position at the end of the month, but this is the way that Realtest can simulate rebalancing the portfolio at the end of each month. By exiting and re-entering, effectively we make sure we've always got 20% of each stock at the start of the month. So let's run this test and see how it does. And there we go. Really great results straight off the bat. We've got 33% return, although quite a high drawdown at 31%. If we double click this, we can see the equity graph. And as you can see, because it's compounding, it's a little difficult to see how it's actually performed here. So one of the first things I'm going to do is switch to a logarithmic scale on the y-axis. And you do that simply by pressing the L key or by right-clicking and you can choose use log scale here. And we can see that when we've chosen a log scale, we've actually got a pretty decent equity curve. Considering this is only uh, trading every month, we've got quite long periods where you can see there are no trades at all. And this is the system doing what it was meant to with those filters. It's excluding trades during potential or real bear markets. And if we actually look at the usage here, you'll see that we use 100% of our equity most of the time. A couple of little places here where there weren't actually that many stocks with a factor above zero. And then we have these big periods, so up until the beginning of 2005, uh, from 2008 through to the middle of 2009, um, we've got uh, another period here and here and so on, where the market is either in a downtrend or is threatening to be in a major downtrend. If we take a look at drawdown, drawdown is generally quite reasonable with some exceptions uh, recently where it really dipped quite low. And the returns, if we look at the yearly returns, are generally positive. We just have this period here where we ended up uh, in 2018 with a negative return on the year. But apart from that, every year finished positive. And that's quite surprising given that it's actually not even in the market for some time. You'll notice that there are 805 trades, and that's actually a lot more trades than we would normally expect for this system. But it's because it keeps exiting every month and re-entering to rebalance the portfolio. So if we show the trade list here, you'll see that Apple, we actually started with a quantity of 259 and we actually exited with a quantity of 518. So there was actually a stock split during this period because uh, it made a nice profit over that period. And when we come to the next month, 
it actually opens again buying this time 465 shares and then it exits again at the beginning of the next month and so on. So as it keeps holding Apple, it keeps exiting and rebuying. Now in practice, this isn't what we would do. We would probably just buy or sell the number of shares required to keep our percentage at around 20%. But this way makes it easy for real tests to track what's going on. How would you actually place those orders? Well, there's a very simple way to do that. And to do that, we would simply put an extra line in the test settings here, which is test output. And we specify orders. So we want real test to actually show us the orders we need to place. And we're going to change the end date from latest to the end of the last month, because we need to actually make sure that real test actually knows which date we want to create this order output for. There's also another command you can add if you are trading through interactive brokers, and that is orders template, and you can specify rebalance. And that actually creates you a separate file which you can upload into interactive brokers portfolio rebalancing tool. But we're not gonna do that now. We're just going to put the order template here, and if I test that again, you'll find that here it tells me at the end of this month, I need to sell these five stocks at these uh, quantities, and I then need to buy them. And you'll see that many of them are the same. So here we are selling mRNA and buying 6444. So in other words, to rebalance to 20%, we would actually just need to change the difference. Um, team would stay in there, ASML would stay in there. DXCM is a new one, and as is Google, or Alphabet rather, and CRWD and NVDA, those are both exiting and aren't being entered in the next month. So this includes both the rebalancing and the exits and entries for the coming month. There is actually another way of creating a system like this, and that is for us to calculate that rank of what the relative momentum is for each stock and use that to decide whether we're getting into a position or out of a position. And the advantage of doing this is it simulates actually holding a stock right the way across several months. The disadvantage is that it doesn't do any rebalancing. In order to do this, we need to use a new kind of command called a cross-sectional function. Let's take a look at what that is. You may remember this illustration from one of our previous videos, where we talked about how Realtest calculates the data section. So when you click the Apply button or the Test button, the first thing it does is to load symbol data and then to calculate the data in the data section. And it will have imported the data into memory already, but now it creates a calculation section in memory for each stock, which includes each of the items you specify in the data section, and it does this once so that you can then run as many tests as you like, and if the data section doesn't change, the tests can be run without having to recalculate everything. So effectively what's happening behind the scenes is this isn't just happening for one stock as illustrated here, it's happening for every individual stock. Each stock has its symbol data loaded into memory and has its data section calculated and Realtest keeps those separate. But using a cross-sectional function, we can calculate things across all of the individual stocks. And cross-sectional functions are denoted in Realtest scripts by using the hash symbol, or some people call it pound symbol. So for example, hash count or hash average or hash sum will basically count or average or sum items across all of the data sections for all the symbols you have loaded in memory for each particular bar date. So let's add one of those cross-sectional functions now. And we want to calculate the rank of each stock defined by the relative strength factor. So we're going to go into our data section here and we're going to add in a new variable called posrank and we're going to define that as the rank, and this is the cross-sectional function, of our factor. And that will rank everything from the highest at the top, rank number one, down to the lowest. But we do also want to exclude any stocks which aren't allowed to be held anymore because they've dropped out of our universe. So we're going to multiply that by can hold, which is a true or false 
uh, variable. And if can hold is false, in other words, if it's not in the NASDAQ 100 or the close is lower than $10 or so on, it's in a bear market, then that will be zero. And so we'll be multiplying this by zero, which will give us a factor of zero, which will then rank it very, very low down to make sure that we don't end up with any stocks that we aren't allowed to hold in our top five ranking. We're going to also define a new parameter called worst rank. We're going to define that as five. And we can now get rid of entry score and maximum positions because that's how real test decides which stocks are going to go into the top five. But we're now going to be handling that ourselves. So our entry setup has been that it's the end of the month and that we can hold this. In other words, it is in our universe and in an uptrend. And we're going to add that it must also have a position rank less than or equal to our number of positions. So it's either one, two, three, four or five rank and that will enable us to enter. And likewise, for the exit rule, we now need to add that we must be the end of the month. And also we must now find that the position rank is greater than our worst rank. That's the rank at which is going to drop out of our system. Uh, we're also going to include one other condition here. Uh, also, we need to make sure that it is not can hold. In other words, if it's no longer a stock that we can hold, then we must exit it automatically. So let's try those changes and see what effect they have. So we click test. We immediately have got two items to sell and two to buy, which are the stocks that are dropping out this month and the stocks which are being included this month. But it, you notice it hasn't actually included all the stocks that we're holding. So we're not rebalancing them in size anymore. We're just holding them. And if we take a look at the results, we've now got a slightly higher rate of return, 36.5%, and also a slightly higher maximum drawdown. And we can double click this and we can switch as we have already to the logarithmic scale. And you can see it's doing an, another very similar job in terms of its equity curve. So to recap, what we're doing here differently to the first system is this system is buying a stock and then holding it for as long as it is in our uptrend definition and as long as it is in the top five rank. And that results in an easier to use order list. So if it's costing you a lot to enter or exit positions, this is great because it only gives you the ones that drop out and the ones that you need to actually enter. And as a result, we can see that it's only making 293 trades over the 17 year period that we tested this, which is much more realistic in the kind of number of periods that you would actually be trading this. And if you've got high transaction costs, then this is a great system. Obviously, the downside is that you've got quite a high maximum drawdown, probably more than most people would be willing to accept. You can try this system with different numbers of positions. We could just use the optimizing system to take a look at whether it's better to actually include more positions. Obviously, we're trading a universe here of only 100 stocks, which is why we've only got five positions. And you can also experiment with how many ranks it has to drop down before you'll actually exit it. So you can make that worst rank, uh, for example, 10. So as long as it stays in the top 10, then you keep holding it. And sometimes that reduces the amount of trading and uh, can be worth experimenting with. So there we go. We've used a simple relative strength indicator or momentum indicator to rank stocks according to how strongly they've been performing on the basis that they're probably going to continue performing with strength in the future. And we then use that to develop a system that trades very infrequently just once a month and yet gives great returns. In the next video, we're going to take a look at how to combine multiple strategies into one system to improve returns and reduce drawdown. But until then, thanks for watching.